Good afternoon to all who have gathered here at the NDW Lionel Memorial Auditorium of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, and also who have joined uh, for this important webinar that the Sri Lanka Medical Association is going to have in collaboration with the Sri Lanka College of Pediatricians. Initially, on behalf of the Council of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, let me very warmly welcome Professor Kapila Pereira, the Secretary to Ministry of Health to this Lionel Memorial Auditorium of Vijay Rama House. I also welcome our past presidents, Dr. Palita Bekun and Professor Lama Badasuria as moderators of this webinar. I welcome Dr. Anne Lindstrand, the co-panelist, along with Dr. Suranta Pereira, who is one of our council members of the Sri Lanka Medical Association for this webinar on vaccination of children against COVID-19. Uh, I mean, organized by the Sri Lanka Medical Association. I'm glad that we were able to organize this important webinar where we would be discussing scientific facts that are important for a burning issue here in Sri Lanka, as well as many other countries in the region, the disturbed education of children. While appreciating the safety of children as the primary objective of medical profession, particularly being a low middle income country, where we, unless we make the correct decision at correct time, the country could be further perished by our incorrect decisions. Why do I say that? It's because particularly in today's context, where with globalization, the, there, has, there, there is expanded, I mean, opportunities, so much opportunities available for an educated child, unlimited globally. So for a particular country, if we think of a future of a country, then we unarguably have to admit that it's the level of the education of children that would determine the future of that particular country. Also, scientifically, it has clearly established that the remote teaching would lead children to learn less than in-person teaching at schools. We are glad that we have two eminent speakers. Professor Kapila Pereira, the secretary to the Ministry of Education, who would give us the first-hand information with regard to difficulties of commencing schools, as well as the importance of vaccination and problems related to vaccination locally, as well as Dr. Anne Lindstrand, United Department of Immunization, Vaccines and Biologicals of WHO, who again would give us important information uh, globally. I'm thankful to both of them for accepting the invitation and also to Dr. Suranta Pereira for his interest on this subject and organizing it as a prompt response to my request. Without much ado, let me invite our moderator and past president, Dr. Palita Bekun, to take the chair of the head table to moderate the session. Dr. Bekun, over to you. Good afternoon to everyone. Thank you very much, uh, President of the CLMA. 
I will not uh, take any time with the preliminaries. Let me first of all invite uh, Dr. Suranta Pereira, who is a consultant pediatrician, to speak to us on vaccination. Anita, we can't hear you. COVID-19 in Sri Lanka. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. I see that uh, so many have logged in. What I would suggest is most of you now know very much about webinars and how to how to how we these are conducted. Please, uh, if you want to ask any question, please use, use the chat function, and then we can come to some of those questions towards the end. Also, later, if you want to have a question personally, then we can use the 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 raise the hand function la later on. And I want to make one little change to what uh, Professor uh, Dr. Padma Gundaratna mentioned. Uh, Dr. Anne Lindstrand is unable to join us today, but uh, she has nominated for us a colleague of hers, Dr. Shalini Desai, who's a senior consultant pediatrician. And also she's the she's an advisor to the SAGE, the Advisory Committee on Immunization in WHO in Geneva. So we will hear from uh, Dr. Desai and not from Dr. Anne. Okay, that's fine. Thank you very much, uh, Suranta. Uh, why don't you start? Yeah, uh, good afternoon, and thank you very much, uh, Dr. Palita Bekun. And uh, distinguished guests at the head table, Dr. Padma Gunratna, President SLMA, Professor Kapila Perra, Secretary, Education Ministry, and our two moderators, Dr. Palita Bekun, past president and the WHO representative, and Professor Sanat Lama Badasuria past president of SLMA, as well as Sri Lanka College of Pediatricians, joining from Rajarata. And as well as Dr. Gwani Linege, our president-elect, and Kosala, who is the vice president. I must thank Anne Lindstrand, head of essential program on immunization, Department of Vaccine and Biologicals. If time permits, she may join. She requested Dr. Shalini Desai, a pediatrician and a senior advisor at the SAGE, Secretary for all the support uh, uh, to support us, and she will join as the third speaker. And I must thankful to them all the support extended to our country. This webinar will become a landmark point of our child childhood vaccination. Here we are going to debate whether vaccinating children against COVID-19 a realistic goal or not. At the end, Sri Lanka College of Pediatricians is going to relook at our position on the above subject and hand over a joint request to the Ministry of Health and the Advisory Committee on Communicable Diseases. Where are the children of this world? Where are the children of our country? I can't see them. They lost schools. They lost play areas. They lost shelter in war -torn areas. They left schools early. This picture depicts that. Children from different countries. Children from Syria. Children from Cambodia. Children from Thailand. This is the plight of the children. The sign that children will bear the scars of the pandemic for years to come are unmistakable, quoted UNICEF Executive Director. The COVID-19 pandemic has upended the lives of families around the world. Across virtually every key measure of the childhood, progress has gone backward in the 12 months since the pandemic was declared, leaving children confronting a devastating and distorted new normal. The children are faced with many problems. List is getting too long. Each day, different dimensions are added, psychological, physical, social, political, it goes on. Look at this list. Sometimes their cry for help is not heard at decision-making boardrooms. This is from the Facebook of UNICEF. Parents are upset. So is the teachers. Please read the comments. Classrooms are empty. Children are at home. UNICEF very correctly urged government to prioritize opening of schools and investing in education. Look at the country, country situation. These data were collected from the education ministry. Sri Lanka has a student population of 4 million. 
majorly lost the most of the school in days. You can see in 2020, out of the scheduled 195 days, only 117 uh, days were utilized for uh, attending school outside Western Province, and 94 only in the Western Province. It has further dropped in 2021, in the first term and the second term, collectively 180 days, 118 days. You can see 55 school days were uh, utilized outside Western Province, only 24 from the West, uh, Western Province. In this backdrop, how do we develop a consensus statement on vaccination of children against COVID-19? Which way to go? Previously, we have not administered this vaccine Pfizer BioNTech in Sri Lanka, and we do not have country-specific research data. We had to turn to West to study ongoing debates, research and recommendations by leading agents to arrive at a diagnosis. This is an interesting blog, belong to BBC News. In UK, they are running few trials to vaccinate between 12 to and 15 years with Pfizer vaccine, and they have recorded the outcomes. The, they are comparing USA vaccination program with their own one. But I want to focus on a moral issue they have raised. This, this is a vaccination of health care workers and vulnerable adults will save more lives than vaccinating children. That is what they commented. Another interesting blog belong to the BMJ. Interesting discussions going in there. They have commented the number of children hospitalized in USC is 191,600. Around 4,000 cases were reported with Miss C. And there were several hundred of cases which belong to Pass C. That is post acute sequelae of COVID 19. Under the age of 18 years, make up 23% of the population that is in uh, USA. But we have to remember it would be the same with us. When they become infected, although they remain asymptomatic, their viral load would be high. Around 2 to 3% of children would be very sick, and several thousands of deaths have been reported. So leaving 25% of the population unvaccinated may pose a threat in future. At the end, they argue in favor of the vaccination of children. We look at most of the available data in the journals and the research outcomes. I picked this up. In the Journal of American Academy of Pediatrics, they concluded that morbidity in COVID-19 more when compared with the influenza, which is being covered with flu vaccine. Why not COVID-19? We will look at the guidance available at WHO. WHO Strategic Advisory Group of Experts, SAGE, has concluded that the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine is suitable for use by people aged 12 years and above. Children aged between 12 and 15 who are at risk may be offered this vaccine alongside other priority groups of vaccination. There's another segment. Some additional consideration have been mentioned. Number one, due to equity considerations, countries are encouraged to donate doses before expanding use of COVID-19 vaccines to healthy children. I do not know how relevant this for us being a middle income country. Number two, the children with underlying risks have been suggested to be included in the stage two of the roadmap for prioritized target population, but only after elderly and medical risk groups in adults have been reached with two doses at high coverage. As all of us know, in our vaccination pro program in Sri Lanka, we, are, we have planned to cover this point at the end of August. When we look at the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, some of their uh, comments, they recommended the administration of Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine for more than 12 years old, and the child will be given two shots within three weeks. Initial clinical trials, vaccine is 100% effective at preventing COVID-19 symptoms between 12 to 15 years old. In addition, children's immune system responded to the vaccine in a way similar to adults. After vaccinating 177 million people in America, there have been more than 1,000 cases of in inflammation of heart resulting in myocarditis and pericarditis. It is more common among the male, young adults, especially more than 16 years, 
especially with the second dose, it may happen few days after the vaccine. USA, FDA has instructed to add it as a side effects of Pfizer vaccine. That itself uphold the ethics in pharmacology and transparency. So after debating and considering available facts, Sri Lanka College of Pediatricians prepared a document containing following. This is the key statement. We recommend vaccinating children about 12 years with comorbidities, special needs, and healthy children, but their parents have significant comorbidities. They have undergone renal transplant or they are on treatment for cancer. With Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, that is what we propose, under the supervision of pediatricians at selected hospitals in September 2021, with the completion of targeted population among adults. This is our key statement. There'll be surveillance for side effects and helpline to communicate and advise if the need arises. We have already allocated pedi pediatrician to all zonal areas. And as you can see, the most of the symptoms are pain, vaccine related, pain, redness and swelling, starting from tiredness, may happen in headache, muscle pain, chills, fever and nausea. We will counsel on specific side effects and what to look for if cardiac inflammation happens, which is uncommon, but we have a plan. And we hope to develop a VSAFE app where the parents can WhatsApp their comments, and then they can uh, send their concerns through emails, and it's a, it will be operated in a web-based manner. When the adults in the population and the teachers are vaccinated, it will also help to protect the children. After six months, there may be a drop in immunity. This is what forecasted among vaccinated population. Children may act as vectors through their through they carry a less risk or more risk. Vaccination of children, starting from children with comorbidities would be important strategy in months to come, even in our country, Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka College of Pediatricians collaborated with the Ministry of Health, Education Ministry, and other stakeholders to vaccinate the teachers through an immunization campaign island-wide. It is taking place, it was a step first step in our strategy. This is our com campaign slide to bring children back to the school. In single, it says Anarakshita Sameka Surakshita Taksalava. In English, in unsafe environment, safer school. This is the moment handing over our position paper on vaccination children against COVID-19 to the Honorable Minister of Health, Mrs. Pavitra Vanyarachi. And again, in the other picture, Professor Shaman Rajindri, President of Sri Lanka College of Pediatrician, he's with me, and we are handing over the paper to Dr. Asil Gunwadhan, Director General of Health Services. He's a man with big heart. So many people are with us, to mention few, Dr. Susi Perra, and Dr. Chitramali, and there are many others. I like to conclude with following remarks. Children suffer much from social distancing. It is argued that the harms from containment measures should be factored in broader perspective on the good of child. Vaccination of children is a public responsibility. Ultimate choice is a matter of pediatric informed consent. Jurisdiction, which permits non-participation in established programs, should also permit choice of vaccine outside of the approved program. When the benefits are more, even if vaccine supply is too short, prior exclusion of children is unjust. It will further exacerbate local and global inequalities. We have to bring children back to the school. All the vaccination of children is not mandatory. Access to vaccine is their right. When they are ill, when their parents are ill, they need vaccines. They do not want to be vectors. Thank you.
many very important issues relevant to us and also on the general subject of vaccination of children. I'm sure there will be many comments and questions as we move. Uh, let me, without any further ado, let me invite uh, Professor Kapila Pereira. Professor Kapila Pereira, as everyone knows, is the current uh, secretary of the Ministry of Education and the person who's in the thick of things, who's handling this uh, issue and the issues related to COVID and children on a day-to-day -day basis. Professor Kapil Pereira, please. Thank you very much. Very good afternoon to all of you. Dr. Malit Nabi Khan, uh, who I uh, happen to uh, get to know uh, during the topic that is relevant to me, that is starting uh, schools uh, under a safe uh, learning environment. In Sri Lanka, uh, our major task is to somehow carry out our normal activities under this global pandemic situation we are globally experiencing. Sri Lanka is no exception. Uh, and this is the uh, norm for each citizen uh, of this world or on this planet Earth, uh, COVID-19, getting to know how to cope with this and how to carry out activities under these circumstances. As far as I am concerned, as far as the Ministry of Education is concerned, as far as Sri Lanka is concerned, as far as the globe is concerned, we are here thanks to the education. And all these marvels of discoveries, inventions, and in simple terms, understanding the environments with which we live and overcoming the challenges, identifying the challenges, as Dr. Padma mentioned in her opening remarks, we will convert these challenges into opportunities. And I am actually a misfit today because I have no idea about uh, the medical profession. And I have been vaccinated as a child on my left hand, like all the children in this country. And the challenge is to continue this education where the future holds for any country is educating the masses, educating the children. We are mandated by the constitution to grant compulsory education of every child between the age of six to 16. It's compulsory. So we can't leave any child um, unattended when it comes to education. And the last slide from Dr. Suranta, although vaccination of, a child, vaccination of children is not mandatory, access to vaccine is their right. When it comes to safe learning environment provision by Sri Lanka, as I mentioned, Dr. Palita, I happened to bump into him when Honorable Minister in his residence, planning the strategy of opening the schools in 2021, January the 11th. Before that, we started the schools in November 23rd of 2020. And before that, before my, uh, my uh, taking over this responsibility, we have had uh, commencing of schools uh, before November 23rd of 2020 in August 
in October and so on and so forth. Again, Dr. Suranta uh, is coming to know to Ministry of Education and on behalf of the children, the newest element or called vaccination of children under the theme that is given to me, starting schools, uh, ensuring the safety of children. What have the Ministry of Education done so far? We have had 10,165 schools now, that is 2019 census. Now we have 10,155 10, schools. And out of this one, we have uh, schools, 1,439, where the school population is less than, uh, uh, less than 51. And then we have another 1,523 schools, which are between 51 and 100. And that counts about 2,962. And altogether we have schools uh, less than 200, uh, about uh, less than 500, about little over 5,131. And you can see these are mostly primary schools. And if you take the age cohorts, we understand we have from grade one up to grade five, and then grade six to grade 11, and grade 12 and 13. So when we take, when we plot strategies to commence the education and starting the schools under safe environments, we consulted the specialist in the medical field. But what Ministry of Education had to do is to find out what are the best strategies for different localities. We have uh, about 312. How it works out is that we have nine provinces. In each of the provinces, we know what are the schools, number of schools, what are their populations, what grade span that is there, and then how uh, long a distance they have to travel. And each of these nine provinces, we have uh, divided them into 312 education divisions. And then as Dr. Suranta mentioned, we have 100 education zones. And then these 312 education divisions, we know the number of schools that are there. And we have uh, in the uh, Sri Lankan government administrative structure, 14,200, what is called the GS divisions or the Grama Seva divisions. And then in parallel or similar to 312 education divisions, there are 334 administrative units. So it's not much of a difference, 330 versus 312. And we know what are the schools located in each of these 14,200 GS divisions. That is the smallest units that we, smallest the, the area that we focus on. And in each of these schools, we know the number of students uh, getting education in these schools, whether they are primary schools, whether they are from grade one to 11 schools, that is called, I don't think it is relevant here. And if I mention this grade span, everybody would understand. Grade one to five is one set of schools. Grade one to 11 span is another set of schools. Then grade one to 13, all the classes and all the streams in the, the GCA level, that is general certificate of examination, A level, we know the number of schools. And we know the student population, just like I hinted, 1,340 something of less than between one to 50. There's one school with one child. Then there are six schools with two children. So. We together with the medical professionals 
Honorable Minister of Education, Professor G. L. Piris, we discussed many a times how to start the schools in the beginning of this year. And there was no vaccination in the window. No equation. The vaccination was not a factor, not a uh, you know factor in this equation. It is how to make sure these children, the prodigies of uh, Sri Lanka, the future prospects, whether they are given the peer experience of meeting with their uh, the, the age cohorts so that they enjoy and they experience what their childhood um, learning in the classrooms. So, Honorable Minister, with the help of Dr. Palita Bekon and all the other professionals, I don't want to mention names because they were groups and we met and they provided all the inputs with the uh, educationists from the Ministry of Education and the provinces. We have nine provincial directors. We have 242,000, 242,000, very dedicated, very focused, very enthusiastic, experience counting ranging from, you know, two years, one year to 35, 40 years of experience of very committed, motivated teachers who are fascinated or who are hungry of, for getting to know and receive the ch children Monday to Friday, 7.30 to 1.30 be it, 7.30 to 12.30 be it, see the faces of their children they used to see every term and all three terms. I mean, this is sin with all sincerity I'm telling, my experience with these teachers, even to date, they are voluntarily, they are dedicated, they are fascinated, and they are very uh, passionate, and they are enthusiastic about taking care of these children, and they don't ask who this child is, and these are children of our country, these are all my children. So when we have this kind of a motivated, uh, the teachers, principals, administrators, non-academic staff, and more importantly, as the country led by his excellency, the president, and the government led by the president, and all the professionals like you, medical professionals, the helping hand, calls, voluntary advices given by many professions. And it came a big, big plus for us to go for conducting examinations uh, for 350,000 more than that grade five scholarship on October the 10th of last year. And from October the 11th to November 6th of GC advanced level, 362,000 students is no, uh, you know, easy task, but we were able to conduct these exams and then con learn the experience just starting the schools from October uh, 11 till November 6th. And we have had no hitch. In this journey, what we ensured is that the Ministry of Education and Ministry of Health since 1916, 1916, Ministry of Health and Ministry of Education jointly had, has school health promotion units in each school. This is the, our heritage of school education, joined hand with ensuring the ch child's health, just immunization, let it be you know, dental care, anything, hygiene, personal hygiene, this unit came handy and we issued guidelines in 2020, May 17th, a booklet, even to prepare a mask, which was expensive at that time. And then uh, what we ensured is hand washing, that is using disinfection, in, 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 uh, you know, the, the alcohol and the soap. And more importantly, the sick room, the comport, the essentials of a sick room and social distancing and bringing the child feeding from the house 
taking care of, of the children by the parents when there is any health slight thing, a fever or cough. And uh, Dr. Suranta mentioned there are uh, students of these 4 million students, there are special healthcare needed people and they are protected and feeding from school at the home and safely transporting with school vans and then ensuring the children are admitted to the school with temperature checks and then the hand washing. And when they come to the classroom, they don't share the, just like the playful sharing their meals and the canteens were not allowed and the meals were prepared from home. These are nitty gritty details, but the Ministry of Health, Dr. Suranta mentioned Dr. Susie Pereira. I remember her, she came to one of the media briefs. She was basically motivating in the country. The health services were giving all the impetus for us to start schools, but safely under these guidance. And it worked, it worked. Unless otherwise there was general isolation by the COVID-19 prevention uh, presidential task force, we were able to comment schools uh, to the safely under these guidance. And schools were provided with millions of money. To date, 682 million rupees to replenish, prepare the sick rooms, the beds, and the protective gear, and then have people stand by, and then uh, safely, once it is detected, uh, people to be students to be taken into quarantine centers while ensuring the schools facilities were provided, hostel facilities were provided, sparing them for national quarantine centers and disinfection, the infect, infection, uh, the sprays of all the premises, PHIs came, medical uh, professionals came in the regions in the divisions, and we kept check on this one, we monitored in the entire island. And we were dedicated to do this one. So it's like the online work. What is offline work? I mean, online means not online teaching. Offline work means when the schools were closed under the, uh, the movement restrictions. We conducted online programs, believe me, some of the teachers whom I mentioned and I praised, I mean it from the bottom of my heart, all gratitude to them, parents, all the people in the society, they converted their own houses, buying digit purchasing digital cameras, recording video recording the material for the children, and then delivering online. The Ministry of Education did the checks progress of the online conducting of uh, the material, delivery of material. It's not only online, it's one, one, one more, not only single mode, social media like WhatsApp, YouTube, Viber, all the groups. And then Ministry of Education as a national program, we had e taksalava 65,000 lessons, all were on website. We have learning content management center from grade one to grade 13, all the textbooks e-learning. And we whitelisted the Ministry of Education website. When you log into this one, it's free, it's free. So that is the, uh, the internet version. Then came the Guru Gedara, Guru Gedara. Guru Gedara is video recording lessons by the best teachers at the National Institute of Education. And then we have about to date about 6,000 of them. And we uh, purchased uh, uh, the national television channel, one channel. We telecasted 16 hours a day from four in the morning till 12 midnight. These lessons from grade three up to grade 13 uh, for 16 hours in single medium three days, 12 uh, uh, the Tamil medium uh, three days. And that is national program. 
Then came the provincial programs. Like I said, uh, teachers volunteering to do have uh, virtual classrooms using WhatsApp, Viber, YouTube. And then in some of the, uh, the, uh, the provinces, divisions, they went after the students who missed both of these things due to lack of um, the signals, accessibility by the internet. And they went what is called in printed material, delivered to the houses, delivered to the, uh, the children through different modes. One week, you would give weeks workload printed. And sometimes the mode of deliveries, the you know, tea, uh, you know, tea pluckers, they deliver, you know, carry these tea leaves that are plucked. And then the, some of the division, they uh, send these things to the houses. One week's work, that is called satipasala in some of the provinces. Then they use regional television, regional uh, broadcasting, and all these, these more than we practice. And those students who missed this, um, um, any mode of this one, we uh, pl planned the strategy with uh, the medical professionals. We were able to start schools with guidance, issuing guidance to parents, issuing guidance to the children, issuing guidance to the comprehensive gu guidelines, health guidelines to the school uh, buses, vans, and their operators, children in the school. And that was the comprehensive plan we developed with the medical professionals in to commence the schools in January 11th. And we were able to start schools. We plotted a strategy where you can bring all the children Monday through Friday, normal hours, if your student number is less than 15. If your student number is uh, more than 15, you divide the class into two, bring them alternate days. If the, your classroom is more than 30, you bring them uh, less, you know, 15, 15, 15 groups because our max is 45 students. That is in the crowded schools. So this is, way, this is how we uh, conducted the uh, schools safely from January 11th up until uh, no, uh, the April 9th, the first term of this year. And then we restarted the schools uh, on January as April 19th. And we, we had to, we faced this third wave and we had to close the schools. Still the schools are closed. Then during this span from October, I think October 13th of 2020, Till to date, we have conducted national exams, G, uh, the grade five scholarship exams. We have released the results. We have conducted GCA level exam. We have released the results. And we have conducted GCO level exams. And we are yet to release the results because we have small hitch. We have to do practical of this one. So that was the past. What is present today? It is uh, Dr. Surat, uh, and his team, the pediatricians. Now comes the vaccine into this equation. So the national uh, target is to vaccinate all the, uh, the masses age 30 and above. By September, I think they are going to conclude. So these doctors, the pediatrician came and asked for an appointment from me. And by that time, they secured an appointment from none other than the prime minister of this country. And they have done a vaccination of the, the pregnant people. So in that one, the prime minister and the minister of uh, education, all the people, Dr. Lama Bazusuri was there, the, uh, the president of the pediatrician was there, Dr. Surat was there, and they, they insisted, very good, Dr. Panit Abekon and the group, they have done this much. Now comes the factor or, or, or the element of vaccination. So vaccination has started. So we have been able to today uh, uh, you know, officially announce that 12th of this month, that is yesterday, from yesterday, we have been able to vaccinate, you know, start, start, start this vaccination campaign within a week, we can finish. I have the data in all the provinces, a good percentage of sometimes 60, sometimes 
being vaccinated already. Colombo, uh, I think all done. So we have 279,000 and the, mini, the government has been able to reserve 300,000 vaccines. So that is successfully okay. And we have a bright few days future to be looked in within the couple of months. So this is how we have uh, ensured safe conducting of our schools. This is for children. Because when I spoke to Dr. Surat this morning, he mentioned the powerful weapon is education. I said the most explosive, constructive explosion, explosives is the ammunition is the education. So I think there's no argument. I am here thanks to education. You are here thanks to education. The mics are here, computers are here, thanks to the marvels of education. Each element is enriched because we are quenching the thirst of young inquiring minds. This is, this is eternal. Nobody can challenge this one. No university, Harvard's, Caltech's, Imperial's, Oxford's, Tokyo's, you know, Melbourne's, uh, Lubumba's, no university has closed so far. They flourish and flourish similar to your organization here, WHO, they are for there because this is for the education. So we have been able to uh, do this one. The last point that I would like to touch upon, catch from Dr. Suratis, he said that why can we edu uh, the vac vaccinate people, school children, age of 12 and above? So I give the numbers and then I have a proposal also. We have grade uh, six to grade nine, the numbers 1.357 million students. And from grade uh, six to nine, we have 600 and, sorry, grade uh, six to 11, 636,985. Uh, then grade 12, 218,191. Grade 13, 202,923, that is totaling 421,114. Uh, uh, 421, Special education unit, 7,502. Altogether, we have two point, little over two point, little about 2.5 million. So we need about 2.5 million vaccines. If you want to be selective, we need uh, 421,000 for the GCA level, that is the, 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 the adult group, grade 12 and grade 13. Grade 6 to 9, we, have, we need 636,985. And Dr. Surat uh, talked about the repercussions and the present problems of not closing the schools. I am not going to dwell on this one because these are uh, the things of our concern our responsibility to educate masses. So what I thought yesterday, uh, talking to my media secretary is very, very good. And he said, sir, now you're talking about vaccinating school children, but where is the money? Why don't you have, have a you know, uh, you know, campaign? We have these numbers, we collect from the society for vaccinate collecting money, and we tell the government, we have collected this fund created for you know, uh, the vaccinating, established for the vaccinating of the school children, 1.2 million. And we collected from the society because society has a responsibility with their, their children, our children. So that is his proposal. I gladly accept it. I'm going to propose after this one to the uh, president secretary, why don't we do this one? So this is the way. We are moving forward and we are hopeful, uh, thanks to uh, the medical professionals, especially the pediatricians and the government medical, uh, I think GMOA, Dr. Padeni, they are all calling me and they are all willing to help all of us. And more importantly, uh, Director General of Health Services, as he uh, mentioned, a person with a big heart, he's busy as ever, and the Secretary to the Ministry of Health, and all the other officials, Dr. Susi Perra, who is responsible for this one, Madam Yu, and then uh, the ministers of uh, health, 
and the COVID-19 Prevention Task Force uh, co-heads and the government and his assistant president and honorable minister and all my colleagues in the Ministry of Education, we are hopeful that we will be able to safely start the schools very soon and give them their life and their enjoyment because uh, one of the persons who came to inaugurate 171st ashtray at the American Society of Heating and Refrigeration in the Hilton, I was there, he's one Dr. William. He said, you work hard, you enjoy the fullest. Thank you very much. So much information, the amount of labor, the painstaking planning that you have done, the innovations you have introduced, and your plans to get the children back to school to own near, near normal lives. There'll be many comments and questions, I'm sure that you might have to explain to some of our listeners and viewers. I see that we have about almost 250 now all tuned in and listening to you. So I hope this is a good forum for you to give a little bit more information and respond to the questions later. Now, let me very kindly invite uh, Dr. Shalini Desai. Dr. Shalini Desai, who is in Geneva. She is the, she's a consultant pediatrician and also the senior advisor to this body called the SAGE, it's a strategic advisory group, uh, which is a main body that uh, advises the WHO on vaccines. In fact, what when we say WHO has approved or given licensing to a vaccine, SAGE is the group that recommends and WHO follows that advice. So Dr. Shalini, are you there? Are you online? Can you hear us? Hi, yes, thank you very, very much. I'm actually just um, turning on my video. Your presentation now, um, and I want to thank Anne. She suddenly got busy, and uh, you kindly you will be able to do justice to what uh, we want you to do. Thank you very much. Please come on. Yeah, you can start. Um, Thank you very, very much. So um, unfortunately, yes, Anne, uh, Dr. Lindstrand did indeed want to join um, this session, but couldn't, um, and so asked that I um, um, join you today. Is it possible to share my screen? I just have a slide presentation. We can make you co-host, yeah. It's all right. Okay. Yeah, right. Can you see my screen now? Yeah, fine, 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 fine. You can see it well. Okay, I'm just going to put it into... Um, let me see what's happening here. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, yes we, we can. can. We can. Yeah, we Perfect. Can. Okay. Thank you so very much. So um, we were asked to provide uh, the WHO perspectives of vaccinating children against COVID-19. And so over the next 15 to 20 minutes, I'm going to try to go through the considerations that we have been looking at here. So just in terms of an outline for my presentation, in order to provide a bit of a background on what the WHO SAGE processes, I'd like to go through some of the products that we've created um, since the pandemic began. So the values framework, a prioritization roadmap, and then product specific interim guidance. Um, and I see uh, from Dr. Sorrenta's uh, presentation that some of these anyways have, have been seen and used um, by uh, Sri Lanka, which is really great news for us. Yes, what I'd like to do is yes, apply yes. the prioritization roadmap to, to children and walk you through the considerations that we had as we were updating the roadmap. And then at the end, I just have some conclusions. So, as I mentioned, um, the WHO SAGE policy development process, we've had three different products um, related to the pandemic. The very first is about- uh, Sorry, Shalini, Shalini, can I disturb you? I'm very sorry to interrupt you. Uh, can you make it full screen? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I was full screen. Let me try again. Um, that play? Yeah, if you click on the icon. Uh, uh, full screen? Full screen icon? Yeah. Oh, I have two screens going, so I have a feeling that the reason that this isn't working for me is because display settings, let me see, swap. Yeah, okay, then let's get that it. better? Ah, that's fine, that's fine. Okay, that's fine. okay, great. Okay. Thank you, sorry, um, sorry. Sorry for, uh, about that. No, no, not at all. I, I actually, I, I have two screens going. Now it's much better. Clearer. My problem. Okay. Um, so the first piece that we had was the values framework, and that um, was to take a look at 
what would help us decide how vaccine would be used and allocated as well as prioritized. And so that was endorsed and published by SAGE in September of 2020. The second thing that we created was a prioritization roadmap. And so the first version of this was endorsed by SAGE in October. It was updated again in November to include risk groups within health workers. And we're just in the process of updating um, the version now, it was, it was at the June 29th meeting of the SAGE, but the publication is just pending. And then the last product that we have are policy recommendations for the use of each of the COVID-19 uh, vaccines. And so just one small point here, while there are a number of vaccines that are being used internationally, um, the process to have a policy recommendation through WHO requires that the product go through emergency use licensing, licensing at WHO, so through our pre-qualification pro, uh, process. There's only been six products that have, have been, that have received um, pre-qualification. So unfortunately, the only ones that we as WHO can speak to. So the values framework provides a set of core principles to consider COVID-19 vaccines as um, global good. And the six core principles that we wanted to embody was human well-being, global equity, reciprocity, equal respect, national equity, as well as legitimacy. Within each of these, we have different objectives and we came up with groups that would fit into each of these different categories. Importantly, the values framework doesn't provide any sort of prioritization of these groups. The roadmap, on the other hand, is meant to support countries to be able to prioritize the different groups depending on the vaccine availability and by different epidemiologic settings. And there's a number of key assumptions that we've had to make in order for us to be able to create this roadmap and to have these prioritizations. Um, so as you can see on the right-hand side of the slide, we looked at three different um, epidemiologic situations, one of community transmission, one of clusters, and the last of no cases. And we looked at this by um, vaccine supply. So very limited where there's only enough vaccine for one to 10% of the population, limited supply where there's 11 to 20% and moderate supply where there's an effort 21 to 50%. Um, just to mention that in the updated roadmap, um, we do know that of course, um, there are a number of vaccines that have met the minimum criteria for um, target pro uh, the WHO target uh, product profile. We also know that they have reached a minimum level of efficacy um, for older age groups as well as for subgroups. NPI, so um, uh, pharmaceutical in interventions should continue to be used. And we do know that there has been for some vaccines an effect related to transmission. In our roadmap, we don't take into account seroprevalence um, or the degree of population protection already established. So as I mentioned, three dimensions, the epidemiologic scenarios, the overall public health strategy, as well as the vaccine scenarios. So this last slide um, just walks through the different products that have received WHO EUL. I'm gonna try, can you see my pointer? Did that work? Can you see that? So the top part here has the WHO EUL, and it shows uh, that our first um, vaccine that received EUL was back in December. And since that time, we've had, as I mentioned, six other products um, that have received emergency use licensure through WHO. Concurrently, we've had SAGE meetings as well as policy recommendations that have been published. And these include the, the values framework that I mentioned, as well as the um, roadmap. And then we've had a series of um, interim recommendations published for each of the vaccines that have received EUL. For some of our products, we've also gone ahead and done updates in Pfizer being one of those products. So now what I'd like to do is move to um, looking at children and COVID-19 and applying the prioritization roadmap. 
So as we were thinking about how to view children within the prioritization roadmap, the first thing that we did was take a look at the epidemiology. And while this is a very busy slide, I'm going to take you through it. So panel A provides um, the epidemiology in 36 different um, settings. There are a number of provinces within China. There are regions within Italy. And then there's Japanese data, data from Singapore, data from South Korea, and data from Ontario. All of these graphs are set up so that along um, the, the x-axis, you first have children um, from 0 to 9, and then 10 to 19, and then you move across the lifespan. And what I hope you can see from this is that the majority of cases that are being reported, and granted they are symptomatic cases, are not in childhood, but rather among adults. And you can see that as you look across each one of these, these charts. If you then go to panel B, what the investigators here did, um, and the reference is just below here for anyone that's interested, is they looked at the clinical fraction of cases and the overall susceptibility. So the clinical fractions are denoted here with a solid line. The dotted line is susceptibility. And they did that again for, they did it overall, they did it for, for different regions within China, and then they did it um, for the countries where they had um, further data. And along the x-axis, again, we have age. And what they found is that there is an age-dependent clinical fraction. So that is much lower in younger age groups. And when you estimate susceptibility, less than 50% are under the age of 50. The most susceptible individuals are actually, sorry, um, under the age of 20. So the most susceptible individuals are actually your older individuals. We then looked at, when we're looking um, at the impact of, of COVID, we looked at deaths. And most of these, again, are in older adults. What we have here is um, from our world in data, and age is here along the y-axis. And what you can see is that for children under the age of 19, the case fatality is lower than for those in older age groups. The data here is presented for Italy, China, Spain, and South Korea, but other publications have shown the same trend exists. So then we looked at risk factors or comorbidities that children or adolescents may have. I've chosen one study that is from the United States. And what they did was they did a cross-sectional survey of children under the age of 18. They used emergency room as well as hospital admission data from March of 2020 until January of 2021. They had over 800 US hospitals that were able to contribute data to this data set. And that equated to approximately over 43,000 uh, yeah, 43, patients of which approximately 30% had underlying conditions. What I've presented here is a figure from their tape or from their manuscript and it's severe illness when hospitalized. And what they found is that some children that have comorbidities are actually at higher risk of severe illness. So then we thought a little bit more about transmission. And when we looked at the data, we realized that children are not the main drivers of transmission. The data that I've presented here is one example um, taken from the United Kingdom where they again did a cross-sectional national sur surveillance study. And what they did was they looked at outbreaks that happened within schools from August of 2020 to October of 2020. Excuse me. Um, what they found um, was, sorry, I should mention, they did have measures in place similar to what our second speaker um, was sharing with us in terms of physical distancing and infection control um, measures. Uh, masking was suggested for secondary schools, but not for primary schools. 
what they found in terms of attack rates for students was, first of all, they found that the number of cases in students in primary schools was lower than in secondary schools. They found that the attack rate was much lower in those in primary school than in secondary school. And then when they looked at staff cases, they found that the attack rate among staff was higher than among students. So then we looked at um, vaccine use in children. And as was mentioned by Dr. Suranta, um, only one COVID-19 vaccine has received emergency use listing for those 12 years of age and older. None of the COVID-19 vaccines have received pre-qualification by WHO down to 12 years of age. They are, um, WHO is currently looking at this dossier for Pfizer. Some countries have already started vaccinating children under the age of 12, um, although I wasn't able to find data on percent coverage, um, but there are ongoing um, pharmacovigilance studies and safety studies. Similar to when we rolled out this vaccine in adults, rare adverse events and long-term vaccine effectiveness is yet to be fully evaluated. And further understanding of the pandemic, specifically related to variants of concern and related to COVID-19 disease. So for example, post-COVID syndrome are yet to be determined. So looking at all of this data in its totality, um, we, uh, prior, we updated the prioritization roadmap and we do recognize that children are dependent on adult as well, adults as well as the wider society for their well-being. And although severe COVID um, does occur in children, I didn't mention mix, but um, as I'm speaking to a group of pediatricians, I suspect that's um, a condition that you're well familiar with. It is rare in children, but it is observed. And finally, the setbacks in well-being during childhood related to activities such as school, um, such as extracurricular activities that have had to be curtailed can have severe negative effects that can be lifelong. So what we've done is in the roadmap, we, we've prioritized children in the following ways. So in stage two, we recommend that after Sorry, let me just go through stage one first. So in stage one, we've recommend that recommended um, health workers at high risk, very high risk of acquiring and transmitting infection be vaccinated. In stage one B, older adults with age-based risk, and that's to be defined by countries, be vaccinated. When we arrive to stage two, that's when um, you have you know, 11 to 20% of your, your, your looking to cover. We add in older adults not covered in stage one. We also add in individuals with comorbidities or health states determined to be at significantly higher risk of severe disease and death. And in this, we do include children and adolescents. Although the risk to children and adolescents is lower within these comorbidities than for adults with similar comorbidities. And additionally, we've prioritized um, teachers as well as school, school staff that are high, high uh, priority. And then in stage three, we continue to um, include remaining teachers as well as school staff. So in conclusion, at this stage in the pandemic, considering global vaccine shortages, the primary objective is to reduce mortality and severe disease and the greatest benefits come from vaccinating higher risk groups. And there is substantial evidence that schools can reopen safely without vaccinating all children, particularly in the presence of other risk mitigation strategies. Just to mention a few things that are on the horizon WHO is working um, collaboratively with a number of different educational institutions as well as countries on a study related to schools and transmission. Um, if this is something that is of interest to anyone in the audience, um, there's a link here as well as an email address um, where you can access the protocol or um, email the investigators in order to also become involved. I've included uh, additional information that you may find helpful um, as you deliberate and decide how best to use vaccine supply that you have. And finally, I just want to thank you for your attention. Can you hear? Can you hear us? 
Shalini? Yes, yeah. yes. Thank yes. you very much. Yeah, a very sort of uh, good position uh, of the WHO and the SAGE uh, as to the state of things right now that you provided. It's very helpful to us. We can work from there. Thank you very much once again. But please stay on. There will be some questions for you, I'm sure. Please, please stay on the call. Thank you. Now we have had three excellent presentations, three different aspects uh, on the same subject. Now we would like to open it for any questions and comments. I see a number of questions on the chat box also. Uh, Professor Lama Bajuri, are you there? Professor Lama? I'm there. Uh, Professor Lama, would you like to handle the, the questions to begin with? Yeah. Okay, yeah. all right. Okay, Please. first of all, could I make some comments, uh, Paulita? Yeah, yeah, surely. Yeah. I think it was reassuring to hear that the schools can be reopened after vaccinating the staff, that's the teachers as the non-academic staff, without vaccinating all the children. That's, I think that was very reassuring. And I'm glad that uh, yesterday, I think some of the schools started to reopen, if I'm not right. Uh, I think that's what I read from the newspapers. Yeah. Now, I think when it comes to I think the topic today is vaccination of children. So I think considering vaccination of children, I think probably if you have to prioritize the children to be vaccinated, I think the first priority group would be the children with comorbidities. I am referring to patients like with chronic disability like uh, thalassemia. Uh, I think that's at the top of the list for comorbidities. Then the qu one question I think from one of the participants had been if children have uh, existing heart disease and with the availability of evidence that the Pfizer vaccine could cause some sort of myocarditis, whether children with heart disease uh, should be given that vaccine. Now, I think uh, I am not knowledgeable enough to answer that question, so I will leave it to the others. So, Suranta, I think a lot of these questions, I think, uh, could be directed to you. So, Suranta, can you take over? Thank you. Yes, uh, what I want to say is uh, the position paper uh, is uh, initiation of uh, uh, drawing attention uh, to the topic vaccination of children. And uh, it is, once it's handed over, yeah, it will be widely discussed in the ACCD. I think uh, when I listen to Shalini and everybody, I also agree if we are vaccinating, we can uh, start vaccinating the children with significant comorbidities. So the number would be around 25,000, if a rough estimate, and we need the second dose. And uh, they will be vaccinated if we, are, if we get the concurrence from the government under supervision of uh, pediatricians. So when it comes to these uh, comorbidities, and Shalini also showed some of the issues like uh, cardiac, respiratory, when they have long-term problems, they're at higher risk. So the, uh, when we talk about cardiac diseases, uh, the, when they're exposed to coxsackie, influenza, and other viruses also, they carry significant morbidity. And uh, so the uh, coronavirus is also in the same position. And uh, if you give the vaccination, uh, the complications are rare, and uh, we have to look at it very carefully for this group, particular group, when we vaccinate, how we follow them up. And then the, uh, when we get this uh, program going on, it would be in uh, September, earliest would be September after getting the data from the schools once the children are referred. Stringently, these children will be screened at hospitals by the consultant pediatricians. So we have to filter out mild to moderate diseases like mild asthma, some small heart diseases away, and then we have to pick up significant comorbidities. So the, we will evaluate the data available at that time also. So uh, it is a, uh, we had to do it very safer manner. And when we look at some of the complications, a few uh, ISO admissions 
and uh, they have almost all have recovered uh, when they develop pericarditis and myocarditis. And then the, for that group, we need a little bit broader discussion. Uh, rest of the groups would be more safer, uh, children with significant morbidity, uh, and if we vaccinate them, uh, I think that if you look at the benefits and the uh, risk, the benefits would be more. And uh, the, we, we are talking about a very small group out of our population at the cross-section of time. And uh, we have vaccinated all the children, the other side of the coin, and the population would be vaccinated at the major of the population, so high risk and elderly would be vaccinated at the end of uh, September, uh, sorry, August, September. So uh, that will give a protection to the children who are at risk also. So once we get, if we get the concurrence, if you are going ahead, we will reevaluate the whole process again in a responsible manner with the evident data at that time. We know it's a two month time, but things are changing rapidly. If you look at all these websites, including WHO, updated 24 hourly. So the, we would have adequate data at that time. Thank you. Thank you. Lama, you want to continue? There is a, uh, I see two hands here, but before I think, that, uh, I, yeah, please. Carry on. Professor Narada Varna Surya, I think, wants to answer a question. Yes, correct. And uh, Dr. Kushlani Jayatilak, I think she's also waiting. Narada, we invite Narada first. Narada, please. I think I have already put down my ideas in writing. You have seen it. Uh, but even more than that, uh, even what Suranta said just now does not actually overlap what Dr. Desai said. Dr. Desa, I said that high-risk categories are in the priority, but she clearly pointed out that the high-risk comorbidities in children and adolescents is very much less than in an adult. So uh, even now uh, you said that there is clear evidence that the comorbidity, you know, uh, comorbidity risk for ch in children with comorbidity, the risk would outweigh the risk of the vaccine. I don't think the WHO or Dr. Desai had even said that. But I must say personally, I agree with only one suggestion that the SLCP has made up to now, that is to vaccinate children with serious comorbidities. Actually, we, we saw Dr. Desai's graph. There were only four that came into that category. Where the, you know, this in the, in the list of about 10, there were only four that crossed the line and shifted to the uh, right, right. So uh, I might agree. Now the third recommendation, I don't know from where you have got this. The third recommendation that you should uh, vaccinate children with uh, with parents with comorbidity. I don't know from what evidence you have gathered this and what the theoretical basis is. Because what I know is that vaccination does not uh, reduce uh, very. Uh, you know, it, it does not eliminate at all the possibility of transmission. And you can have asymptomatic infection and transmission. And what I feel is if you vaccinate children saying to prevent them infecting children, you might actually induce complacency and asymptomatic children who pick it up from school might go and actually infect them, right? Or vaccinated children. So I, I think your third recommendation is absolutely without evidence. That is what I feel, right? Okay. So uh, I don't want to say anything more, but I would like Dr. Desai to confirm I think the only point Suranta made is that things are evolving all the time. I agree with you and things can change and more things might happen. That is true. And also you said uh, vaccination of all high-risk adults will be completed by September. I mean, that is wishful thinking. So let us not uh, plan what we do uh, till we know how much of coverage. And I, one other question I would like to ask is, I would like to ask Dr. Desai, what are the countries that have started vaccinating children over 12 and how what percentage of adults in those countries are already vaccinated right that that is a question i would like someone to ask thank you thank you narada lama shall we invite dr desai to make a few comments yes i think and dr desai could respond yeah dr um, desai thanks few thank you some of the current practices um so in terms of countries that have already started vaccinating children 
Um, there are a number, the two that come to mind the most readily are the US because they started the process. We can hear you. Say, can you say it again, please? The United States. The United States has, right? They were the first to have started. That was where FDA had provided um, emergency use licensing first. Uh, there's a number of countries, including Canada, and then there's um, some other countries within the EU that are investigating whether they um, offer licensure, first of all, to um, the Pfizer BioNTech product for children age 12 and above. Um, and then whether they introduce it into their, their programs or not. Um, also, just to mention that Moderna uh, has also um, provided their dossier to the FDA in order for children up to the age of 12 to be vaccinated. And some of the other vaccines, the Chinese vaccine, for example, um, it is being, it has been tested anyways in children up to the age of three. Um, so like, sorry, the other way around. So three and above. Um, none of that information has been seen as yet by WHO. And as I mentioned, even um, for the Pfizer uh, recommendation, our current uh, pre-qualification process um, does not go down to 12 years of age for um, the Pfizer product. Can you uh, also, while you're on it, uh, also mention what are the likely vaccines that are on the road now that are being examined by SAGE uh, and expecting data for children vaccinations? Is there anything um, on the so, line? Uh, we anticipate that there will be data from Moderna um, forthcoming shortly. And um, AstraZeneca has not uh, indicated that they will be looking at children. As I mentioned, both Sinovac and Sinopharm, I believe both have indicated that they have data related to children. I don't know whether they'll be submitting that to WHO or not. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Paladha, Paladha, could I ask Dr. Desai a question? Please carry on. Yeah, when it comes to comorbidities in children, uh, what would be your priorities? What would be the priorities for comorbidities in children? Um, so uh, thank you for that question. Um, within SAGE, we actually have not come up with a list of um, priority comorbidities. So what I presented was one study that was done in the US. It was a large study. Um, but what we've seen is that there is regional variation. And all of the studies and all the data that I've presented is mostly from high income settings or high middle income settings. Um, and so issues, comorbidities such as um, malnutrition or thalassemia may not be adequately represented. Um, within the studies that we've looked That's at. Right. Yeah. Unfortunately, there is a systematic review that hopefully is going to be published any day now that was done by Imperial College, and they actually looked at um, high income, middle income, as well as low income to see what um, risk factors, comorbidities would be appropriate in different settings. It hasn't been published yet, though I haven't seen the final manuscript. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think uh, in your presentation, you mentioned that uh, neurodevelopmental disorders is a low priority. So the cerebral palsy is a low priority. Is that right? So again, it was just one study um, from the US. And essentially, um, similar to what we see with adults, when you add on additional comorbidities, you increase the risk to a child. But as I said, the risk in adults with comorbidities is higher than the risk in children with comorbidities. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. No problem. Lama, shall we invite uh, Dr. Kushlani, who has been waiting for a while with her hand up? Yeah, Dr. why not? Kushlani? Dr. Kushlani. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, yes, uh, I actually have two comments. I think uh, Professor Narada mentioned some of them uh, earlier. Because I agree that, uh, I mean, we have to, uh, with the data that was presented nicely by WHO, I think we have to uh, look at the big picture. Now, uh, without, before starting immunizing children, I think the priority is to immunize the adults. So it is not only the cost, but also the availability. We have to take that into account. 
so that is very well uh, i think uh, established and also shown uh, because the, uh, the 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 main aim of the vaccine is to prevent the high risk or, or, or the people should be uh, given to the high risk uh, people who are getting uh, more severe disease so that is why uh, the prevention of severe disease is the main aim so in that uh, the third objective that was discussed about the adults who are having high risk at home that actually will be covered because when the adults are vaccinated, the parents of the children will be vaccinated. So therefore, the, the, the problem will not be a problem because the, the, the people who are at risk will be vaccinated if you cover the whole uh, adult population. So that is the, I think that is what we should aim at. So that even if the children, sorry, yeah. Yeah, so that is, I think that is why, I mean, uh, it's more rational to, complete the vaccination of the adults before we uh, think of the children, I think, with available data. And also it was noted that in the primary education, we are worried about opening up the primary schools, I think, even in the past. But you could see that in the, with the data that was presented by, um, the, the, in the, from the UK, uh, the primary uh, uh, students did not uh, have a big problem. So therefore, if you vaccinate the teachers and the staff, and open up the schools that would make a big difference. I think it is, I think that is what we should aim at. And also, when we are discussing about the guidelines for the schools, now we say, okay, every other day we ask the like half the class to come. Sometimes it's very irrational when you look at it, like, okay, how can we repeat the same thing for the next half and all that? Also, it has to be considered when you are developing guidelines. I think. Uh, and also saying that, okay, maximum is 30, maybe not very rational. If you have a large class, you can have more than 30. It depends on the size, the, the ventilation of the classes, because we have to consider the setup of our schools, where we, in bigger schools, we have bigger classrooms, and also most of our classrooms are well ventilated. So therefore, the problem of uh, spread may be different. So therefore, we have to now. We don't have much data because our schools were open only for a few months, as we saw earlier. So I think we have to consider, look at the big picture, look at the evidence, and uh, decide on the on how to open with the proper guidelines, rather than thinking of vaccinating all the children before opening. Thank, so you, thank, you, thank, you, thank you, Dr. Kushani. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kushani, for your valuable. Parita, can I respond? Yes, please. Yeah, I think when it comes to vaccinating school teachers, we should take into account uh, not only government schools, but private schools also. And also, also uh, the, two, uh, the tuition teachers, and as well as the drivers of school vans. Those also should be considered. And I think I agree with Dr. Kushra and Jayadilika that uh, sort of the uh, the classroom size of classroom vary from one school to another. So let the PHI of the area together with maybe the, uh, the, the uh, pediatrician of the area visit the schools and decide how many children could be safely taught on, at a single time. Let that decision be taken by the health authorities together with the PHI, uh, including the PHI and the pediatrician. I think that would uh, sort of help to solve that problem instead of giving sort of generalized instructions for the whole country. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see any other hands up. Uh, Can I add something to that? Uh, if you don't mind, and again, Kushlan here. Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, uh, one thing is like we were, we were now, uh, we had the hospitals running with, uh, with these infection control committees. Likewise, if we have uh, like a committee in the schools, which will look into those problems, we can always guide, uh, maybe we can get the help of the microbiologists or, or some infection prevention and control personnel, maybe PHIs uh, to help. And then they should monitor and they should uh, get the, give the guidelines based on like for each, hospital, each school can take their own the, the decisions and uh, practice the guidelines. I think that is how it should be. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think extremely valuable ideas. I'm, I'm sure Professor Kapila is also listening. Uh, I think Padma has raised a hand. 
Yes, yes, I can yeah. see. Yeah, we are uh, very annoyed. Yeah. But not the... Thank you very much, Professor Kapila, for that uh, excellent presentation. Now, uh, as it is that we all understand that, I mean, our effort is to open up schools as early as possible. I mean, that's the effort in all of this discussion as well. And then the, it's very clear that without getting the adults vaccinated, that it's not possible for us to open the schools. So if that is the case, is there a place for us, like the way that we vaccinated teachers, is there a place for us to announce and to say that the parents or the guardians of all the school children to prioritize vaccination so that at least, I mean, say, if, if we try to vaccinate all people more than 30 years of in this country, then it, it would take some more time. But then if we prioritize the parents of children and then try to start schools, is there a place? Who likes to make any comment? Professor Kapila? Um, Padma, you want to comment from yes, Kapila. in particular? Yeah, Kapila. Professor, Kapila. Professor, Kapila. Professor Kapila, you have three, four questions. I think you can yeah. respond to all of them one after the other. I'll uh, go uh, yeah. one by one. Uh, first, first and foremost, uh, uh, Dr. Kusilani's question. Uh, precisely, you mentioned Dr. Palita knows uh, that when we started the school, the second uh, strategy during uh, the second uh, time opening, precisely we had a unit established at school level. Each of these schools in the country, we formed a unit, right? Let the principal along with uh, the committee where PHI was one, the health, uh, the MOH, the, the provincial uh, authority, there was committee, the Gram Sevak, uh, the parents, uh, then the school development uh, society, uh, and all the, all the people were one unit. They were, we issued guidelines because based on the social distancing facilities in one of the, some of the crowded schools, but in each of the localities, they were given independent decisions because in 2020, everything was given by Isurupai, everything was controlled by Isurupai, that is centrally. But the second time around, we went precisely for school units. That is, as I said, 1916 onwards, Ministry of Education and Ministry of Health had this uh, school health development societies where we included the PHI, we included the health person. Now, this time we have the pediatrician in each of the 100 uh, zones. So this is the latest one. So this, if at all, if we are going to start schools, uh, the, the third time around, we will have the pediatrician giving these decisions, right? That is that. Then when it comes to the internet facilities, providing internet facilities, we have uh, 3,413 schools. We have, a G we have a GIS map. All the schools, where all the details, not only the, with the availability of signals or not, we have mapped out division-wise, zone-wise, uh, the province-wise, entire country-wise, each of these schools, if you click the dot, it will say what is the signal availability or not. So thereby, we have 3,432 schools without internet facility, that is signals. So if you look at this one, out of 10,155, you think it's a bigger number. But what we looked at is that total number of students is around 755,000 in this 3,000 odd schools. So that is out of 4 million children. So these are mostly remote areas. So we, at the Ministry of Education, we have mapped out this one. And then what we have done for these uh, localities, we have, as I uh, you know, uh, came here, before I just came here, uh, we, I just checked the progress because we have with the, uh, on the Ministry of uh, the Digital Infrastructure, we have uh, uh, strategized where we will provide near identifying these localities, the number of students, we established uh, 
2092 centers focusing on these places where there is no signal and it is i just check the progress and for example we have mind uh, the the laboratories thousand in the country with 65 computers in each and then if that is not feasible we identify a school where without computers and the facilities we uh, borrowed uh, and provided these things and we minimize the number and uh, like uh, dr jayatilak mentioned then again, uh, we have I have a case study where provincial health authority in North Central Province did not allow us to start that even, right? That is only yesterday we were given the green light. So it's not starting schools; it is getting these children without the internet or signal facilities to these centers. Be it a temple, be it any other. Uh, center, we provide at least minimum uh, of, uh, you know, maximum of 25 students with social distancing, and we have empowered zonal directors to make sure and it is manned from 7.30 to 3.30. So they come and they uh, participate for online classes. So providing internet facilities, we know the where the signal is, where, where we know there is no signal, but the in whether COVID is there or not, we are going to provide with all 10,155 schools by the Telecom Regulatory Authority. DG has promised we have put a cabinet paper. In future, all these schools will, will be provided with fiber optics. Not only the fiber optics. This is this takes about one and a half years. We have a plan, and then the the bill also will be uh, paid, reserved money for bill paying from the income of the Sri Lanka Telecom Regulatory Authority, which is given to the treasury that is reserved for uh, the payment of this one. So that is that. And then uh, we have uh, the O-level practicals. Uh, O-level practicals, uh, actually we started, uh, we wanted to release the results without O-level practicals and based on the school assessment, but there are a lot of protests. Now we had to stop and we scheduled from May 15 to May 22nd, and we could not do this one. And we will see we are 169,000 students who have sat for this one. This is the hitch where we are not able to release the results. Madam, uh, the last one is your, uh, your question. Um, can you just repeat the question again, please? The, what I want to know is that now, if we are to... Uh, as the way that they talk, the pediatricians and as the science reveals, that the adults in this country all have to ah, be yes. vaccinated for you to start schools. Right, madam. Uh, that, now we will see this way, right? We know uh, each of the localities, as Dr. Jayatilak mentioned, and Dr. Abekon and the group help us to empower these school units. Let them decide, for example, number of students and the minimum uh, like we have about uh, 5000 uh, schools with uh, less than you know 200 students and we will decide the parents and everybody on this one whether they are vaccinated or not this one and then we can uh, do this one uh, find out uh, the parents uh, who are to be vaccinated and decide on this one okay yeah, one of the discussion is the number of students in a school isn't it when the small smaller schools have more problems also Yes, and yes. then we can open them up and there are certain districts like yes, yes. Uh, Polonarva, Hambantota, Ampara, the COVID incidence also yeah. very low. Some of the factors we can uh, discuss, I mean, regional level. Yeah, that's how we do. Yeah, we can give a little bit autonomy when it comes to school and opening. Actually, Doctor, yeah, we, yeah, we have given the autonomy since January 23rd by circular. Uh, what the difference between October 2020 and January 2011, 2021 is that the autonomy was given to the school, this unit. Yes, thank, you. thank you very much, Professor. Uh, Paulita, Paulita, excuse me, yeah. uh, Dr. Lakuma Fernando has a question. Yeah, we are going to go. Uh, Lakuma, come on, please. Yeah, please, please ask. I just, just want to ask uh, when are you sort of. Uh, you know, the teachers are given given the Sinopharm vaccine. So given the sign since we are giving the Sinopharm vaccine, and by the time we if we start and complete it at the end of the end of this week, 
we will still need six weeks from that time uh, because they will get the second dose after one month before they start uh, some protection some protection so that means that we we can if that is done as a prerequisite to starting schools that we can start schools uh, from september uh, not from uh, next month that is one the other thing i i have written that also that is when it comes to the the children who have sort of people with comorbidities i don't think the children should be vaccinated it should be the we have to just make sure that we think that by the time the school start and those people who are at home with high risk the the older people as well as those with comorbidities will be vaccinated especially if you are starting schools in september it's time that the country's current vaccination program will make sure that those uh, people at home with comorbidities be vaccinated by that time we have to assume but if it does not happen then we will have to at least before starting schools we will have to have some idea as to whether there are people at home with comorbidities or high risk who are not vaccinated if so we have to have a mechanism as madam gurunath also said to make sure that those who are at home uh, with high risk are vaccinated not the children the people who are at, at home with comorbidities be vaccinated Thank yeah. you, Dr. Kumar, for your uh, comments. I think they'll be taken. Uh, Professor yeah, Kapil had to leave. Think, uh, he had to leave because he had an urgent appointment. Uh, yeah. Pandita, I think Pushrani has another question. No, no, no. Actually, I just wanted to comment on uh, Dr. Uh, the, the Madam President's uh, question about the uh, the vaccinating the uh, parents. Because anyway, now the priority is given to the high risk populations of adults. to vaccinate the high risk population anyway so they should be vaccinated by, by that time uh, that is one thing so anyway it's not uh, parents who are young and fit may not be at highest risk so it doesn't mean that every parent should be vaccinated before opening the schools that should not be the case uh, and also because most of the parents may be young and they may not be having comorbidities and they they need not be the priority for vaccinating them so i don't i think anyway the priority should be to vaccinate the high risk populations of adults anyway which is happening now so that is what we should continue and uh, again uh, to open up i don't think all the teachers have to be vaccinated also because anyway you now we, we manage to work and all the all the working places are functioning so we have to follow guidelines and we should have some uh, way of monitoring so that the schools also should be considered as an essential service and that should be uh, yeah. functioning thank you Thank you very much, Dr. Kushdani. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Very valuable comments. I would Gouni. like to invite uh, Dr. Yeah, Dr. Professor Goni Lien again. Any comments? On behalf yeah. of the College of Pediatricians, uh, would you like to say add a word to? Yeah, please. Yeah, uh, please use the mic. Professor Goni is the president elect. In incoming president of the. college of pediatricians uh, yeah. i think uh, we uh, listen to uh, uh, listen to three speakers and uh, basically we have some sort of an idea now how to go ahead with uh, protecting our children and uh, um, vaccinating the the required group so it's still i think uh, under debate whether we should go ahead with go ahead and uh, vaccinate our children so i mean in the time to come as uh, suranta said things are evolving uh, so we might like uh, come into a decision consensus uh, whether to vaccinate them or not uh, and uh, apart from that i'm very glad that uh, we have like have made plans to start school as soon as possible so we have a actually a plan either in september or october we might be able to open schools and get the students back into uh, uh back it to school and at the same time i actually wanted to ask this question from professor kapila pereira now i understand that there are a lot of school dropouts i think what i heard is uh, yeah uh, informally there are some school dropouts so whether we have uh, uh, taken any action for that whether to get them back and and whether we have a mechanism to do it so i think uh, as college of pediatrician and slma i think we should discuss that uh, with the ministry of education yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh i think we could do it with the help of ministry of health with the the yeah. the infrastructure yeah. that is available thank you 
Thank you very much. I think there will be a lot of things that you will have to give by, by way of inputs, uh, your expert. Uh, in, make this Malita, I think Narada has another question. Yeah, Narada, quickly, can you ask your question and then let's close. Narada? Narada, I thought you had a question. Uh, no, not a question. Just, uh, you know, because I don't know. I just want to point out uh, Dr. Desai's uh, presentation had a lot of information. And another really valuable slide which caught my eye was that the children are relatively low transmitters compared with adults. She showed that they are really insignificant as transmitters, you know, in the, in the total global data available to the WHO. So I think yeah. we are basing lots of our uh, so-called recommendations on, uh, you know, not on, on conjecture, not on uh, this thing. So I think Guani also said that things will change. Okay. Now, our question today is, should we vaccinate children before starting school? So I think the clear emphatic answer is not necessary. I think that is what the WHO said. That is what common sense is. About, about comorbidities, even what Dr. Desai said, we are not clear. Because in that large study from the states, she emphasized that this is not a collective global information, but it's a large study from the states. In that large study from the states, uh, Lama, uh, Sanat, me, cerebral palsy and things were not high risk comorbidities. You know, like uh, there were yeah. only two things uh, which really crossed the line to cause this thing. So yeah. I'm not against identifying comorbidities and vaccinating. But anything else, I think, is totally premature at the, uh, this stage. And the suggestion to vaccinate children to prevent adults getting, I don't know from where that suggestion came. I mean, okay, this no, okay, you, like made your, point. you made your point. Yeah, point is very okay. taken. Can we, uh, Alama? I can think we just, Malita, uh, now the time is one forty-five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Lama, one second. I want to just uh, refer to the, again to Dr. Desai whether she has any last comment to add before we close. She has gone. She's gone. Yeah, she uh, has put a note saying I'm going. Uh, okay, thank uh. you. Then Lama, we should invite uh, Malita. Palita, yeah. Palita, she didn't answer once she evaded one question we asked her, which is to name the countries which are vaccinating <laughs> children. She didn't tell I, it. So I'm going no, to no, tell no, it. To I, I, I can give that answer. I checked that up. There aren't yeah, many. Yeah, can you give that answer? Can you give that answer? Singapore has started for the elder children with Pfizer, 17 yeah. and above or something. And but very few. Israel also. Huh? Israel also. Yeah, Israel. very few countries. United so, States, Israel, and Singapore. Three countries. And, and the US. And uh, I think some Eastern European countries are thinking of that. We can get those details, but certainly you're right. At the moment, not many countries have done that. Yeah, so that's true. Uh, Lama, I'm going to ask Dr. Suranta to make a few comments because he was yeah, uh, um, going to. I'd like to sum up uh, all the comments. Uh, I think uh, we wanted to initially draw attention to MCH concerns, maternal and childhood concerns in the midst of uh, this pandemic, COVID-19. So I think uh, we came together, we had discussions with the College of Obstetricians, Perinatal Society, and the College of Pediatricians. Uh, presidents, we came together, we discussed. So I think uh, we were able to, uh, the, this decision came from the College of Obstetricians to vaccinate the pregnant mothers, initially with risk factors. Then uh, uh, this week, it has been chain to vaccinating pregnant mothers uh, who are in the second and third trimester with uh, uh, risk factors. And uh, then the second thing, uh, vaccinating the teachers. So we, we, we were able to coordinate with the epidemiology unit, MOH, and other stakeholders and initiate it. Uh, and then uh, we were able to vaccinate even the uh, workers at the examination department, the officers, uh, because uh, uh, one time I can remember Kapila was telling Professor Kapila, uh, the people to mark examination papers, they have to come together. Some of the exams papers cannot be marked uh, and they had some issues. Uh, so the third factor, what we want to discuss was we are the, what's happening with the children. So the vaccination of the children, we had to do carefully. So the, uh, we, the paper we go, gave was uh, just eye opener. And then we want to reshape it, reposition our stance with, the, this, with this discussion. 
there will be many more discussions in weeks to come. And then uh, we liaise with the WHO SAGE group in Geneva to come to a more safer uh, decision before vaccinating the children. Because uh, uh, we felt as a group, uh, we need more brainstorming sessions. Let people comment independently and then uh, decide about what is the safest uh, group we are going to vaccinate if we are going to and when and uh, where. So I think uh, uh, some of the groups here suggest that after vaccinating all the risk groups, that is more than uh, 60 years old, then we can bring the mortality. If I can remember in Sri Lanka, one of the comments was uh, below 75%. And if we vaccinate at risk pregnant mothers and uh, 18 to 60 years with comorbidities, uh, we can uh, bring down the mortality to 95, not the morbidity mortality. So uh, that's a, a significant achievement. If we can achieve the, our targets, a month to come, fingers crossed. Yeah. And uh, so the uh, vaccination of the children, uh, the one criteria we, 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 we are focusing on is uh, children with significant comorbidities. So the number is going to be smaller. So we liaise with the WHO, uh, but the, the, this uh, attention to the MCH activities in the midst of COVID-19 will continue. As Gwani suggested, there are many other dimensions, the school dropouts, the psychiatric problems face, faced by the children, and then how we bring all the children back to the school. Those comes to uh, very prominent questions in weeks to months to come. So uh, we will, we, we, are, we like to engage all the stakeholders. Our decisions are not static. Those are suggestions, but we have to develop a framework for this discussion. That is what happened. And uh, this will be intensely debated in weeks to come. So the end point would be the beneficiaries would be children in our country. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you summarize it excellent. I think that's, that's the spirit I think in which we are moving. Engage everyone, get the information as we go, uh, formulate and cut our, cut our own road for Sri Lanka, so to say, in this uh, particular area. Uh, let me now thank everyone. Thank all of you. I think we had over 260 people who participated on, in, the, in the discussions in the, in the webinar. Uh, let me finally thank uh, the three excellent presenters for the valuable information and ideas that they gave. Let me thank the Sri Lanka Medical Association for, I think, hosting this. I think Sri Lanka Medical Association has been very active and very useful to all of us by bringing in the latest in knowledge and experience in areas related to COVID-19 and in other areas, obviously. Uh, let me also thank the College of Pediatricians and uh, very particularly Ranta Yu, because you were the live wire behind this organization mm -hmm. with uh, Dr. Padma Gunratna. So thank you very much. I think it was a webinar that benefited all of us. And like you said, ultimate beneficiaries should be the children of this, uh, of this country. So thank you very much and uh, have a good day. We will close with that. Thank you all. Thank you very much.